What's up, Resonate? Good to see you today. Uh, again, like Matthew said, my name is Keith. I'm lead pastor here. And before we get into the content real quick, I want to shout out to Eastern Washington, also to Central Washington. Man, excited to have you guys uh, via video. So we are in the second week, as, as, as said, that um, in this, this idea of exploring what does it mean to have the perfect selfie. And last week we really got into this content and um, we tried to land in a place that the Bible's beginning to expose some stuff. Uh, and, and we're kind of pushing deep and, and we're kind of having some, some significantly introspective thoughts about who we are. So if you're someone who doesn't tend to think that way, uh, this might be a stretch for you, right? This might be something you're like, man, that's kind of mind blowing. This kind of going deep in, in that. But last week we started with this idea uh, of this big truth. Um, and you can and listen to the whole thing on the website, um, but, but we're just going to go back and just give just kind of some nuggets to help us to get on the same page. And, and really, we started with this first idea that what we believe about ourselves affects everything else about our lives. What we believe about ourselves affects everything else about our lives. And this is a significant thing because if we don't do some business with this, what we believe about ourselves, then we kind of are ambivalent to kind of how this is playing itself out in so many other ways in our lives. Not only that is the second thing, is that we have three potential sources that feed what we believe about ourselves. When we begin to think about what is it that actually uh, informs us about what we believe about ourselves, or where do we get the information Information that forms our opinion of ourself, our identity, worth, uh, purpose, and stuff like that. Three sources, and those sources are other people. Uh, we, we talk about this idea that um, we live in this world of comparison. We know who we are because we see other people, and we begin to play that comparison game. Uh, not only that, but unique to our place, um, both geographically and in time, uh, there's another understanding of identity that's begun to be a place in our culture uh, that has been, over the last 20 years, taught to us, and that's the idea that we give ourselves identity. And this is this idea that if you just believe in yourself or you just do what you do, right? Um, you know, there's these phrases, uh, you know, believe in yourself or you just do you, man, you know, um, stuff like that that is informative of who we are. But we ended up in was we studied Paul and saying, hey, I don't let other people determine my worth. I don't even let myself determine my worth. My worth is determined by God alone. And so that's that third source and as we looked at it peered closer in this this is the only place that allows us to ultimately have satisfaction and joy the bible tells us that what god thinks about you um, is really the definition of who you are that the most important thing that you believe about yourself is what god believes about you i hope that makes sense to you because when we begin to believe this we begin to push into this and say if God alone determines our identity, then nothing else is creating bondage in us. There's no other assignment of our worth put upon anyone else but God who created us. And so we end up walking in freedom instead of slavery. And so the difficulty is, is that just because we have an awareness of this freedom that is available to us as we begin to believe what God believes about us in terms of our identity, it doesn't mean that we ultimately choose to walk in this freedom. And the question is, why do people who are offered freedom choose to walk as slaves? And, and this is what we're gonna be pushing into today. As we begin to say, the question is, if you have this understanding of what it means to walk in freedom, why is it that it's so difficult to believe what God believes about us? And so in, in lieu of where we were last week, and as we begin to see um, all the kind of the strongholds that culture is, is, is telling us who we are. I felt like we need to just press into this and say, what is it that allows us to really believe what God believes about us? And we're gonna get into that. I want you to hold that thought and rewind with me to my freshman year of college, right? Okay, right? All of a sudden, all the way back. I won't tell you when, all right? So this is um, this moment, um, and, and as a freshman in college, that, uh, that I'm going into uh, college, and this has a point. This is gonna tie together. And, and as I'm going to college, you know, there's this desire to, uh, to really have it all together, you know, and to present myself as someone who really has it all together, and, um, and specifically to present it as someone who has it all together to members of the opposite sex, right? 
right? And so, um, so I began to make friends with this girl, and this girl, um, she ended up liking uh, to rollerblade. And so, um, and so I know that's kind of a strange thing in these days and age, but um, I wanted to like her and have her like me, and so I decided to do what normal people do, right? And buy a set of rollerblades in order that we might be able to rollerblade together, right? And you might, not, you might say, you can just stop there, Keith. That's an enough of an embarrassing story that she would say, I was a rollerblader, right? And so um, in this, um, we, uh, we began to, to rollerblade together, and, uh, and I began to rapidly try to learn um, so that I could keep up. And, um, and I have this like, issue in my life uh, about competition, and, um, and there's this, like, this thing called Strength Finder, and one of my strengths, my number six strength, is competition. But that comes out in really negative ways a lot of times, like games and stuff like that, and also when you're trying to impress girls. Like, so, so we're doing this thing, and I began to think, hey, I want to um, impress her, but at the same time, this war within me is like, you have to compete, you gotta go faster, you gotta, you know, all this kind of stuff at the same time. Well, I'm just, you know, rollerblading, we're on campus at, uh, we're rollerblading throughout the, uh, the sidewalks, and, uh, and here I am, you know, swish, 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 you know, just like a good rollerblader does, right? And I look behind me to see where she's at, and all of a sudden, like, there's this moment where it's like the entire world erupted and sucked me into it. Like, I didn't know what was going on. All of a sudden, I find myself, I'm laying on my back, there's like, like mud and mush and concrete and pipes. Like there's this pipe like right next to me. I'm like, I just almost impaled myself, right? And I'm hurting, right? I'm hurting in multiple ways. One, physically, I'm trying to figure out if all the parts of my body still work, you know? And so I'm laying there, I'm like, fingers, check. You know, toes, well, I don't really know because I have rollerblades, you know? So uh, legs, you know, and so I'm like, I, I think, I'm alive, right? And, um, and then all of a sudden she rolls up. And what has happened is I fell into this pit. See, they were doing construction because there was a broken sewage main. And so there's this um, open hole. And what they decided to do, you know, to, to make sure that people didn't fall in, was put those, uh, that, that mesh around it um, that keeps nothing out, you know, maybe like, <laughs> nothing. And so I go, in, I go right through this orange mesh. Maybe they made it orange so that most people would say, don't go in here, but I was looking the opposite way, right? So I go in here and I fall into this pit. It's like four feet deep. And I was like, you, you know, there's some pain, but at some point you're like, okay, I'm alive. I'll deal with this. And then a, a, a completely different kind of pain then emerged. As this girl that I was trying to impress slowly approaches the pit, right? I bought these for you, right? And um, this is, I'm, I'm totally trying to make a good impression. And she's like, what happened there, pal? I was like, pal, I bought rollerblades for you. And I get a pal and I was like, I get it, right? I've fallen into a pit, right? This is what I get. And so this is like this in incredible, like way more than the pain of landing and almost getting impaled, but not quite getting impaled, you know? And like trying to figure it out, way more was the, the look on her face when she saw me in the pit, right? This was like the most damage that was done. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredibly, incredibly embarrassing. You know, I, I was like, maybe if I died, there would be some, at least some pity, you know, um, in, in this. And so, uh, I mean, this was just, it was one of those things. It was like scarring. I get up and I'm like, I'm in serious pain. And I try to like shake it off. Like, yeah, just fell into a pit. No big deal, right? You know, let's go back. Let's keep going, you know? And, uh, and then finally I was like, I'm, I'm about to puke because of this pain. And this is going to get really bad. So I went back to my dorm, uh, you know, limped back. I think I took my rollerblades off and walked in my socks, you know, back to my dorm. It was that bad. And, and so this is just this huge, embarrassing moment. Now, I got to tell you that uh, ultimately she married me, and so I win. But uh, yeah, but there was a space of about two years where it was iffy, right? Um, we dated other people, and we were just like, oh, you're the pit guy, you know? So. Um, we might think about embarrassing moments, and we've all had those kind of things, right? We've had these things where it's like, what is going on? I wish I could rewind that. I wish I could take that back. I wish, uh, but each and every one of us, you know, if we press a little deeper, this idea of what embarrasses us, uh, what, there's some stuff that's not just about something that happened to us, 
But there's stuff that goes deeper. This is the stuff that is not just what happened to us, but who we are. And that stuff is the stuff that we don't want anyone to know about. That stuff is the stuff that we are ashamed of. That's the stuff that, that maybe is a part of what we'd say, this is who I am, and I wish that I could change this. I've tried so hard to change this. I wish this, this wasn't me. I wish this wasn't my past. Maybe if they knew this about me, man, people's opinion of me would change. And what I want to say is, is this. When we begin to think about um, this reality, this truth of these things that we want to stay hidden in our lives, these things that create shame in our lives, these things that we don't want anyone to know about, these are the things that ultimately we try to hide and yet form a significant amount of our identity. And when they form a significant amount of our identity, what they do is they put us into bondage. They put us into slavery. We take, and this is something that we begin to own, and what this does is it creates a barrier to accepting what God believes about us. There's almost like this impermeable reality for us that we can't fully believe what God believes about us because we have these, these deep things that we try to hide, these shameful things that we live in. And, and, and the reality is, is that we cannot simultaneously live in freedom and in shame. It doesn't work. We cannot live freedom, live in a, a free life and live in shame. And yet what happens is we allow shame to exist in our lives. We can either believe what God believes about us or we can live in shame. And what I want to talk about is this reality that when we begin to embrace what it means to live free as we begin to say, God, I want to believe what you believe about my identity, about what you believe about me, this this is something that is so hard for us to do, and I want to figure out why is this? Why is there a collision of these things in terms of us being able to experience freedom of having an identity that's formed in Christ, and this collision about what it looks like when we try to overcome those places in our lives that we want to change, that we want to hide, that we are ashamed of? And I would submit to you that this is this reality that deep shame is creating shallow identity in Christ. That, that most of us, most of us aren't experiencing the depth of acceptance and freedom that we are created to accept because we allow deep shame to stay and inhabit the deep recesses of our hearts. And that deep shame creates shallow identity in Christ. And the thing is, there's many people that have lived years and years and years and will continue to live years and years and years in shallow identity in Christ because they don't come face to face with some of these deep, deep places of shame. I know we're, we're getting deep really quick in this but I believe that this is a key. Like, this is a life-changing thing. And if you'll just stay engaged with this, that it's gonna do something with us. And let me give you kind of a diagnostic question to see kind of where you're at in this. When you do something wrong, when there's something that you do, and each and every one of us kind of know what that is, when our conscience kind of begins to kind of kind of let us know that something is going wrong, that there's something that we kind of feel something about, um, do we immediately run to God or do we run away. Do we run to God or do we run away? This is a helpful thing for us to understand. Are we really embracing what God says about us or are we kind of saying, I'm going to allow some shame to live. I'm going to kind of have an idea that God loves me but not allow that to penetrate the depths of my heart. Do you run towards God or do you run away? This is the thing that I want us to explore because when we begin to look, I, I could talk about scriptures where it, where it begins to tell us truth about how we should act, but I really feel like this is at the core of our emotions, uh, and so this is going to be a little bit more emotive, more than logical. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to see Jesus, and I want you to see how he treats people who have their shame revealed, because if we are courageous people, there's going to be some moments where we say, I'm going to be tired of carrying around the burden of shame, and, and and I need to know what Jesus is going to do if 
this gets outed. And so I want us to look in Luke 5, because Luke 5, what happens is we begin to see Jesus interacting with people in just a, a really powerful, powerful way. So you can turn on your Bible, or you can open your Bible, whatever it takes for you, but we're going to go to, to Luke 5, and we're going to see what Jesus does. The first thing I want you to hear, the, the first idea that I want you to understand is that as we look in, uh, in this context, that Jesus confronts shame by exposing its power over us. This is the first thing I need you to get, that Jesus confronts shame by exposing it in our lives. And now, this is not the greatest thing that you've heard today because this is hurtful, this is painful, but I need you to know that it's the pain for a little while that allows you to have freedom for a lifetime, okay? So let's get into this. What we're getting to see is, is Jesus is arriving on the scene. He is preaching passionately and powerfully and people are beginning to respond to who Jesus is. Again, this is not a very long ministry and especially in a, in a age and in a day where, where it doesn't proliferate and where the channels of communication are slow and they're individuals, what we begin to see is Jesus beginning to build a powerful teaching, man, teaching ministry. In fact, it's so powerful that what we begin to see is that people are beginning to surround Jesus um, uh, in, uh, on the side of this lake and he's teaching them. He's just dropping wisdom on them. He's just helping them to see truth in this and they're, like, they're kind of crushing him and so he sees these boats. He takes, jumps on a boat, heads out into the water a little bit so he can begin to teach them so his voice carries and so he can um, begin to help them to understand. And what we begin to see in this is that Luke doesn't tell us the sermon. I mean, there's thousands of people who are listening to this sermon and Luke doesn't tell the sermon. He tells the actions of Jesus after he finishes the sermon. And I think this is what's powerful for you and for me to see how Jesus treats men who have their sin and shame outed. So we're going to see this. See, Jesus is teaching, and it says this in verse 4. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, let's go catch some fish. Put in, out into deep water, let down the nets for a catch. Let's go catch fish. Then Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. And he goes on and he goes down to verse six. He says, when they had done so, they, they ultimately went out and said, okay, Jesus, if this is what you want us to do, this is what we're gonna do. In verse six, it said this. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Then Simon Peter saw this. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. This is Simon Peter, known as a guy who is the fisherman, right? Simon Peter, what he does for a living is he fishes. And what happens is Jesus gets done with his sermon and he turns to Peter and said, let's catch some fish. And Peter does something really interesting in this. He says, get this, he says, master, we've worked hard all night long and we haven't caught any fish. Instead of, okay, let's go catch some fish he begins to reveal something about himself. He's, he's saying to Jesus, uh, man, about that fish catching thing, let's, let's rethink about that because um, I can't. I've, I've been doing this all night long and I know that, you know, I'm Peter. I, I'm the fisherman, the, the fisherman, the, the man who catches fish, right? But I can't do this. And, uh, and so in the midst of Thousands of people, all of a sudden, Peter's having this moment, and it's an embarrassing moment, right? It's a moment where him, he, he's being kind of outed in terms of his capacity to do the thing that he knows how to do, right? This is his professional thing. And the carpenter is telling the fisherman, hey, let's go catch fish. And then what happens is he says, hey, I haven't caught any fish, but let's go just because you say so. And then we have like all these fish, so many fish, that we begin to have our boats begin to sink because there's so many fish and here's what Peter does. He says this, get away from me, Jesus. Peter just saw the most amazing thing. He's fished all night long. He's a professional fisherman, right? And the carpenter comes out and says, hey, why don't you go out again and fish? And he says, there's no fish, but I'll go anyway, Jesus. And all of a sudden his boat is full of fish. And instead of saying, my goodness, you would be very good for business could you stay on this boat? We could use an extra hand. Why don't you get rid of the carpentry thing and do your magic fishing thing, right? 
This is, this is what Peter could have said, right? This is the most amazing thing that we begin to see. But what he says is, get away from me. Why? Why is this? Because Jesus, he teaches, then he turns around to Peter. He knows what he's doing in Peter's life, and what he does is he outs shame. He takes and he speaks to Peter in a way that reveals this raw spot of insecurity, this raw spot of sensitivity, this this place where Peter doesn't know if he measures up. And what he wants to do is the same thing that you and I want to do. When our insecurity is exposed, when our shame is outed, what do we wanna do? We want to run away, we want to flee. We want to be someone who who gets away from those things that are incredibly uncomfortable. This is just who we are. We all want to run away from this truth. And here's what Jesus says. I I mean, let me go back to this and just say, no sensical person would be able to say, hey, I just saw amazing thing and here's what I want to do. I I want this guy to leave. I want this guy to to exit. I'm absolutely crushed by this. We do crazy things. It is just, when I've seen people that have their shame outed, it's like they lose their minds. And and what happens is this, this insecurity that is rooted so deeply in us, like rational people do irrational things. When you have arguments and you hit a nerve, you hit that sensitive spot, you hit that insecurity, that shame we will just lose our ever-loving minds, right? We just, I mean, you've been around someone and they're like just flipping out. Why? Because it's so connected to the depth of our identity that if someone touches that, we are crushed and we can't take being crushed. And this is what Jesus says. It says, don't be afraid. Why does he say don't be afraid? Because of this. Because in these moments of insecurity, that fear begins to overwhelm us. You see, um, a guy named Tim Keller, pastor in New York, says this. He says, to be loved and not known, but to, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. It's comforting but superficial. You see, this is this reality that that I think that many of us live in, that we could articulate that we think that God loves us, but I think that practically we believe that God loves what is most lovable uh, about us, and if God really knew the depths of the stuff that we thought about, the stuff that we, we did when no one's looking, the stuff that we kind of manipulated, the stuff that we kind of had our hands in. If, if God really knew all of that kind of stuff, we can kind of present the outside. We can pretend pretty well. But if God knew this kind of stuff about us, God wouldn't like us. That God would say, you're not worth loving. And so in this, what we tend to do is we intend to embrace the superficial because it's comforting. So I'm not gonna allow myself to be known. I'm not gonna allow this, this, this deep shame to be accessed by you, God, to, for this to be kind of outed in some sort of a way. But what Jesus does is he takes and he presses into those moments of shame. Here's the next thing he says this. This is why. He says this, to be known and not loved is our greatest fear. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Our deepest fear is that someone would say, I know you and you're not worth loving. And so what we would rather do with God, what we'd rather do with other people is say, I'd rather take superficial and protect myself from my deepest fear. And so we live shallow lives of identity in Christ because we allow deep shame, because we're not sure that really Jesus is going to like what he sees. The same thing with other people. Here's what we do. And here's what happens in our world. That our our spirituality, it kind of goes in terms of our schedule, in terms of our friends, in terms of uh, the our understanding of how much sin we're doing, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. And so there's this reality resonate that, that oftentimes I see people that are hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. And what I know and what I see 
is that this is somebody who has a shallow identity in Christ because they're allowing the, kind of the external things to build or draw down their faith. What happens when we allow him to be known and for us to be loved, or us to be known and loved, it creates a rock solid foundation in our lives. It says this, but to be fully known and fully loved is well a lot like being loved by God. It's what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of our self-righteousness, fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. How do you stay solid through all the things that life is gonna give you? You become both accepting of God's love and fully known, which means the deepest, darkest spots that you're trying to hide come out into the light and are healed. This is what Jesus, Jesus confronts, and here's what he says. He says to Peter, don't be afraid. Here's what you're gonna do. From now on, you're gonna fish for people. Maybe because you couldn't catch fish, but that's besides the point, right? I'm gonna help you out. Here's what he's saying. In his deepest place of shame, Jesus comes in and says, I'm gonna provide for you. I'm gonna do something with your life. And here's what I want you to get. Each and every one of you, this is what Jesus says to you, that he is going to be there alongside you. And if you're trying to figure out how do I put myself together, how do I make sure that I do all right, you're asking the wrong question when it comes to your deep part of your identity because he says, I have this. I'm not gonna allow you to fail. I'm gonna be there alongside you. I'm gonna make this work. See, Jesus says, here's what I'm gonna do. Here's your calling life. Here's your purpose. You think you're full of shame. I think you're the perfect candidate to build my church upon. You see, never was a more significant task given to a more insignificant group of people. They're overwhelmed by this. Hey, start a worldwide movement. You're you're struggling to catch fish, right? But I want you to start a worldwide movement. This is what Jesus does. He takes the unlikely people, and if they begin to say, hey, I'll put my trust in you, I'll put my hope in you, I'll put my identity in you, he uses them in incredible, incredible ways. So we keep going on this, and this thing that we do. And so Jesus confronts Peter. He outs his shame. He reveals his shame. He confronts his shame. That's not only what he does. Jesus confronts shame by replacing the lie with the truth. As we begin to go through chapter five, the next person that we see is a leper. A leper approaches Jesus. If you don't know what leprosy is, it's a skin disease. And the skin disease made them isolated from all the rest of the people in their community. They were, uh, you could see it. It wasn't something that you could hide. This is something that no one wanted to be around the people with leprosy. They were outcasts. They were uh, shameful people because of what they were done. In fact, most people that have leprosy and had leprosy would have not, after they were diagnosed with leprosy, would have not had any human touch, possibly for the rest of their lives. This is how isolated, again, so we see Peter in the shameful moment, we see the leper, he, his life is a shame, right? He is ashamed of, he, he's isolated, he is outside of the norm for the society, and here's what he says, here's what he does, he goes to Jesus, and says, while Jesus, in verse 12, was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered in leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I think this is incredible, because here's what he's saying. If you are willing, you can make me clean. The definitive part of that statement is the fact that he is identifying that Jesus indeed has the power to heal him. It has been demonstrated. Jesus is healing people. He's doing something. He has a power that is supernatural. But the question that this leper has is not whether Jesus has the capacity to heal him, but whether Jesus wants to. Whether Jesus wants to. He says, I know you can make me clean. I just don't know if you want to make me clean. I don't know if you desire to make me clean. I don't know if you desire to take away what shames me. I know you can do it, but I don't know if you want to. This is the same thing. See, shame creeps in, and it begins to distort our minds with lies. And we begin to hold on to our shame because we don't know if Jesus really wants to do something about it. We know he might could take it, but we don't know if this is just out of obligation 
or that Jesus is just saying, you know, okay, you're doing this again. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'll, I'll forgive you again. We get into this thing, you know, this body image thing again, this porn again. Like, w- what's that thing? As we begin to think through this and we begin to think, oh, God doesn't want to, to do this. God's, God's annoyed with me coming back to him that, and Jesus doesn't want to hear my confession again. And we begin to have this lie that our shame makes us undesirable to our heavenly father. And Jesus takes what is undesirable and communicates back to him. He says this, I am willing, as we begin to look at that word, I desire to do this. It is my pleasure, it is my desire, it is my hope, it is my joy to be able to heal you. It says this, be clean. And there's this reality. I think oftentimes we think about the, the, the love of God and then we can just kind of say, well, God has to love me, right? This is kind of in his job description for God so loved the world and what I saw at football games on signs and stuff like that, right? Um, I'm just talking about the John 3, 16 thing. So uh, in that, as we begin to think about what God, we think this is God's expectation, man, sometimes we don't realize that he desires to do this. So the man has shame and Jesus says I desire to do something about your shame resonate you need to hear this you need to understand that Jesus desires to meet you where you need to be healed you're not annoying to him you're not something that he's just trying to figure out again he desires to do this not only that Jesus confronts shame by revealing what's behind it Jesus confronts shame by revealing what's behind it. See, what happens next is it begins to be known that Jesus is this guy who's healing, right? And so all the people that need healing begin to find out, hey, where's Jesus' schedule? Like, where's, where's his next stop? And they find out that Jesus is in this house. They begin to try to get into this house um, to, uh, to be able to, to get to Jesus, but it's a, it's a packed crowd in the house, right? So they're having a house party, Jesus in the middle of it, and he is preaching, and, um, and they're listening, and these people say, hey, we got a friend that needs to be healed, and we don't know how to go about this, and we don't want to miss our opportunity to get an audience with Jesus, and so we're just going to do what everybody knows what to do when you want to get to Jesus. You take the roof off the place, and so they begin to take and dismantle the roof, right? And so they're pulling stuff off, and they say to their, their friend, no, no, we're, we understand what we're doing. Yeah, okay, so no, he's not going to be mad. Okay, so uh, here's the thing. We're going to lower you down, right? Right in front of Jesus. He's not going to be able to miss you, right? So this dude comes lowering down on this pallet thing, right? He's like eye level, with Jesus, you know, and he's cruising down, and I'm not sure if Jesus stops or if he just kind of keeps going, but, uh, but obviously he knows that this guy needs to be healed, and here's what happens. When Jesus saw their faith, he says this, right? He, he needs to be healing. He says, friend, verse 20, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. They get, they take the roof off. They lower themselves in front of Jesus. Here's their place, the guy who heals people, and, and what does Jesus say? He reaches out and, and he says something to this guy, and he says, friend, your sins are forgiven. And I wonder if the guy's like, oh, no, 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 no. No, see, my, the problem is my legs. And the problem is I can't move. I'm paralyzed. The sin forgiven thing, hey, we can get to that, and we can have a long conversation about that. I'd like to do it when I can stand face to face with you. That would be really helpful, Jesus, because if you didn't know, I'm paralyzed. So this whole sin forgiven thing is not very helpful, Jesus, right? <laughs> and so Jesus... Jesus is, 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 is going at this, this root issue. He's revealing what's behind this. And this is the genius of Jesus. This guy obviously is shamed. He can't walk, right? This is this, they're, they're going to great lengths to get in front of Jesus. And what does he do is he confronts this guy with a significant need. He goes deeper. He's not saying, I'm just going to do something about the external thing. I'm going to go to the root of the issue. Because see, what's behind shame for all of us is sin. It's either your sin, maybe you've done this and brought shame on yourself, you did something, the consequences are shameful to you, or it's someone else's sin that you are suffering from, 
but it's always sin. And when we begin to think through this, Jesus is trying to get to the root of this. You see, there's a difference in, in, in guilt and shame. There's a difference in what this looks like. See, as Jesus went on, he began to reveal what he's doing. And he began to sh- see, here's, what's, here's what I'm doing. I'm forgiving your sins so that here's what can happen. Jesus the Pharisees, they're freaking out. And they're like, no, 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 you can't do that. You, you cannot do that, Jesus. That's against the rules. Um, now, this is all in their head, but Jesus knows what's going go in their head, so he redresses what's going on in their head, but he dresses it out loud. So he gives this is Jesus. He's just doing crazy stuff. So they're saying in their head, in verse 21, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Verse 22, Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? which is easier to say, your sins are forgiving, or get up and walk. But I want to tell you, or I want you to know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. So he says to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he says, does, so does this mean that my legs are healed? Okay, it does. Great. Man, this is wonderful. Thanks. Finally got to this place, Jesus. Huge appreciation. He says he went home praising God. He stood up in front of him, and he goes home praising God. See, what Jesus goes after, he said, there's there's an issue. We're going to get to your legs, right? We're going to get to you being paralyzed. But before that, we need to go to the heart. And and, and what Jesus is doing is going to the core of who we are. See, the external things, what we do, uh, guilt is connected to the things that we do. But shame is connected to who we are. And you need to get that because there's a difference in guilt and shame. We can feel guilty about things that we do, but shame is at the core of who we are. And what Jesus does is he goes to the core of who he is. So what Jesus does, this is the, this is the gospel that he says, hey, your bigger issue is not what happens in this world. Your bigger issue is what happens with your soul. So this body is gonna fade away. You're gonna die and, and the bigger issue is the fact that your sins stand separating you from your heavenly Father. And I have come to create a bridge between you and your heavenly Father. This is your deepest need. When you understand the acceptance of your heavenly Father because of me, you now have no shame in your life. You can live a shameless life. And this is your deepest need. And I'll heal you but I need you to know that your thing that's more, more significant in your life is that you would be reconciled to your heavenly father, not that this issue would be taken care of in your life. We spend a lot of times praying for the issues of our lives. And I think Jesus is whispering back, that's secondary. If you'll just believe what I believe about you, that's a bigger deal. So we're praying for all kinds of stuff, but allowing deep shame to exist. And Jesus says, I'm going for the root of this. I'm going for the core of what this is. I want to reveal what's behind shame. Last thing, Jesus confronts shame by healing it. Jesus confronts shame by healing it. And so what does he do? He said, after this, Jesus went out. He saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Two words, right? Jesus goes to the guy who was hated. The guy who participated in in, in basically government-sanctioned robbery. See, he was a tax collector. And so the Roman government, the occupying force in, uh, in Jewish life, collected taxes from all the Jews to pay for everything that they needed to pay for in the empire. They needed representatives to collect those taxes. And the way that the representatives made a living is they would, they would take something above what the Roman government took. And this was not regulated, and so they could enrich themselves to a significant degree. So not only were you representing the occupying force, but you were fleecing your fellow countrymen and enriching yourself. And the only thing that they could do about it is they could hate him and create an awkward social reality for him. He's shamed. This is what he lives. He lives as rejected by all of these people. What does Jesus do? He goes to the shamed person and he says, I want you to follow me. Again, Jesus, massive crowds, superstar rabbi, right? 
Jesus says to the hated person, I want you to follow me. And their minds are blown. They're like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Why are you going to this person? And Jesus is making a point about what he wants to do in every single one of our lives. And here's what he says, two sentences. He says this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinner, sinners to repentance. Here's what this says about us. See, we are the sinners. And Jesus wants to do something about it. Jesus wants us to recognize two things. One, that he is not here to condemn, but to heal what is hidden. And two, Jesus knows that there's some stuff in our life, the insecurity, the deep hidden shame in our life that has to be healed, not hidden. And as long as we keep the junk hidden, he can't heal. But he wants us to come to him, right? He's the doctor. And doctors don't, you know, when they have patients, they're like, oh, what is this? Another sick person again? What are you kidding me? All day, sick people, sick people, sick people. Why can't just normal people come and visit me in my office, right? No, of course not. Jesus expects sick people people that have insecurities, issues, people that are struggling because they're listening to the world say something about their identity. And he's saying, I want to take and I want to heal what is hidden. And he uses a word and he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is, it's not save or redeem, it's talking about calling. This is related back to your identity, your purpose, your significance, your worth, what you're put on this earth to do. Jesus is saying, here's the thing, when you begin to believe this, you hear the calling of your heavenly Father saying, I want to heal what is busted. I want to redeem, I want to, I want to take and help you to learn how to live out what I've created you to live out. See, Jesus, he crushes shame. He's taking and helping to say, I want you to have a better life, not just a different life, but a better life. If you'll just listen to my voice and not the voice of the culture, he has come that he might heal those who need healing. The people that have shame, that is that force that keeps the overwhelming, accepting, huge love of God from permeating every bit of them. And if you do this, resonate, this is just a transformed life. This is something crazy different. See what's happening in these stories? Jesus confronts their shame and sets them free. Sets them free. And here's what I want to just, if you're to say, what do you want me to do, Keith? I want you to get a vision in your life about what it would be like to live free. And then I want you to be discontent every single day of your life if you're not walking in freedom. And I want you to be so, have such a holy discontentment in this that you begin to say it's worth the pain it'll take to expose the shame so that Jesus can heal it so I might walk in freedom instead of slavery because that's what he's created me to live in. Are you listening to the world around you? Because there's a calling on your life. There's a truth about your life. And you're either accepting it or you're ignoring it and letting shame rule you. See, one of the things that's really important to me in my life is being able to, um, to put my kids to bed because it's in these short little moments that I get with my kids when I put them to bed, when it's just me and them in their bed, and I get to, before they shut their eyes and they go to sleep, I get to be a spokesman for who they are and to tell them their identity. And I say basically two things almost uh, every time I put them into bed. I've told them this every single, uh, every single time and, and it progresses in their age. But if I was to take my seven-year-old, I say something like this. I say, you know what? If someone were to tell me to line up all the other seven-year-olds in the whole wide world and then told me that I had to pick my very favorite one, do you know who I would pick? eyes locked on me, 
And I say, I would pick you. I would pick you. And they just kind of get this little smirk because they kind of know I've said this enough. Or the nine-year-olds or the four-year-olds, I would pick you. And the other thing I say to my boys is I say, I am so proud of you every single night. And to my little girl, I say, you are precious to me. I say, why do you say that? Because all around them, the whispers of the fact that they're not good enough, this idea that they're going to see that they don't measure up, that there's something that someone's better at than them, that somehow they're not as, uh, as this or that, those things are going to begin to crush their identity. And in those moments, I want them to hear their dad's voice telling them who they are. And my hope is that every night when that truth gets inserted, that it becomes louder than the culture around them. But the truth is, still, there's going to be a day we're going to have a conversation, and I tell them, you know what? It really doesn't matter what your daddy thinks of you. What matters way more is what your heavenly father thinks of you. Because someday you're going to leave and not every night I'm going to be able to tell you these things. And you need to know that your heavenly father is way better than your earthly daddy. And what he says about you is never going to change. There's going to be a day when I'm not here anymore. But that's not going to change who you are. See, that's my prayer for my kids. And that's my prayer for you to. And that's my prayer that in those moments of insecurity, that desire to hide, that you can recognize that emotion and you can say, this is not what God intends. Take this, God. This is not what you have to say about me. I don't want to live in slavery anymore. I want to bring out that deep shame so I can have a deep relationship and identity with my Heavenly Father.